Hey, good morning, everyone. If uh, you need a Bible this morning, we're going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 13, so raise your hand, and we've got some folks that will bring those by uh, to you. Um, interesting, uh, again, we, we, we share this, it seems like, almost every week, um, how the Lord coordinates, you know, the service and the prayers and the songs and the times of fellowship. You know, the second song that we did this morning, I, I wrote a line down. Um, it said, I'm so glad that my freedom isn't based on what I've done. Amen. And in context of this chapter today, I'm so glad that my freedom isn't based on what I've done. And I'm so glad that my freedom isn't based on what has been done to me. And that will come out today as we, as we walk through this, uh, this, this chapter. Um, we, we postponed chapters 13 and 14 um, because, you know, we wanted to give some time and space to these, very sensitive, and, and uh, therefore we begin that now. If you remember back in, in 2 Samuel chapter 10, David had, had won a great victory. He had defeated the Ammonites and the Syrians. It was a high moment for him, just as any leader would have a great moment after a victory. And then in chapter 11, the very next chapter, David, David himself, King David, he falls. While, while he was at home, he sees Bathsheba uh, bathing on the roof. He took a second glance. He took a third glance. It all went down from there. Uh, David got this other man's wife pregnant and had her husband killed in an attempt to cover up what he had done. And you would ask the question, how in the world can a man after God's heart do something like that? Well, it happens. And it did. And we saw the fallout of that. We saw chapter 12 where the prophet Nathan, inspired by God, comes and rebukes David. And David confesses. He said, against God only have I sinned. And of course we know he had sinned against way more than God. But God the Holy Spirit broke his heart in that moment when Nathan spoke up. Aren't we thankful that, that Nathan spoke up? So glad that people meet us where we are and say hard things to us sometimes. And that's what happened. And, but the tragedy of his child dying happened nonetheless. And then a greater ongoing set of consequences were foretold. As Nathan said, you know, under the inspiration of God, that the sword shall never leave your house. And what he was saying here is he was saying, David, your choices in this situation have started this snowball effect that's going to trickle down into your family and so much depravity despite the fact that you're the king, despite the fact that Jesus will come from your lineage, such a downfall will happen as the result of this. David, David had sinned. David was negligent. And, and his sin would lead to so much negative impact for his family. We'll see today of the sexual abuse, the murder, the estrangement. David's son Absalom today will take matters into his own hands, partly because dad had never done anything about the problem. And it continued to infest the family. Another of David's sons would die. And, um, and Absalom himself would live estranged away from his father for years. Uh, what's more, as we'll see today, a daughter would be severely violated sexually. And have her life seemingly ruined. So there's a lot of heaviness in this chapter today. Look at it as we focus uh, on this today. Um, and I have to set a timer because we have a lot to cover here. Um, we're going to focus on both the violator and the violated. Um, and I think there's a message in this um, for, for, for everyone here today. Whether or not you've been involved in anything like this. Guys, this, you know, the Bible is not Photoshop. There's no video editing in Scripture. You know, Scripture tells it like it is. And because we teach verse by verse here at Thrive, we do not skip difficult subject matter. And I, I appreciate, I know we've been praying uh, for you guys, for the body. We understand that there, there's a lot of sensitivity in this, in, this, in this chapter here. There may be very well many people here or many people tuning in listening that have been sexually violated in their lives. You've been raped. You've, there's been incest. Or perhaps you're sitting here today and you've done that to someone and you're feeling guilt and you're feeling estrangement. We want you to know that there's hope in Jesus Christ for all of us. Okay? And that's, that's the theme that we want to come back to as we walk through uh, these uh, these things today. I'll tell you that the world entertainment today, as it's called entertainment, I, I to be quite honest with you, would call it trash. But there's so much entertainment in the theaters and online today that highlight what's happening here. Guys, this is not something to be entertained by. It's something to be repulsed by. 
And, and, and let's keep that in mind as we walk through this chapter this morning. 2 Samuel chapter 13, we'll start with the first nine verses. Now Absalom, David's son, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And after a time, Amnon, David's son, loved her. And Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very crafty man. And he said to him, O son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, Let my sister Tamar come and give me bread to eat, and prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamar, saying, Go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down. And she took dough and kneaded it and made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. And she took the pan and emptied it out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, send out everyone from me. So everyone went out from him. Let's pause there. So Absalom, David's son, had a sister named Tamar. We've got a family tree. I'm only going to take a minute to do this because we, we need to figure this out here, okay? And so David had eight wives that we know of from Scripture, uh, likely more. He had a lot of concubines. The red lines here, I don't expect you guys to honestly be able to see this, but the red lines here are the wives of David. You see there's eight. You guys know me call. Remember, she never had kids. Of course, Bathsheba, uh, which we just talked about from chapter 11. One of David's wives um, was Ahinoam, okay? And Ahinoam had a son, Amnon, okay? So there's, there's one of the characters today. Another of David's wives, Makah, okay, she was the princess of uh, the region of Gesher, which was in the northeast part of, of Jerusalem, so a neighboring area. Probably likely David um, picked her up uh, as he was fleeing back in the day when he was fleeing from Saul. But nevertheless, we have Makah, and Makah had Absalom and Tamar. So again, Absalom had a sister named Tamar. And then you've got another wife, uh, so uh, the step situation here uh, with Ahinoam, you have uh, Amnon. So they're related, okay? They're related through, uh, through, through dad. Um, we've, we've, we've talked before about polygamy in Scripture. We're not going to go back to that now. It's not God's design. It's not his best. Uh, a lot of mess here uh, would, would happen. But it says that after a time, Amnon loved her. Guys, we know that there is nothing at all pure about the love here that is described. Better yet would be the word lust. David saw her. She was known as a beautiful woman. We'll see that in a minute. David was, oh, excuse me, man, forgive me. I'm going to mess these names up and I really don't want to do it today. All right. Um, but Amnon, it was all about his pleasure. Um, and, and no real care for her. And I guess that was an appropriate faux pas because the same thing happened with David. It was all about him and Bathsheba and it wasn't anything for Bathsheba. So maybe that was an allowable mistake. But again, it, it was inappropriate. He shouldn't in any way uh, have been a part of this. He, when he, when he, when he, as he, over time, he loved her. Over, okay, over time, the lust grew. He should have walked away at the beginning of that. Guys, we've talked about this before. If this is you, you need to starve whatever feeds your flesh. You need to get rid of it. You need to walk away from it. You need to put it under your back tire and run over it. You need to, you need to avoid places. You need to avoid people. Okay, what Jesus said, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. So whatever it is, get rid of it. There were boundaries in place. Okay, God had put those boundaries in place through his word by saying this is not acceptable. This is not allowable. So we need to captivate these thoughts, captivate these desires before they destroy you. So let's make our first point this morning. The first three will come quickly. The remaining will not. But point number one, and again, this is mostly focused on the one who's going to be uh, doing something with someone they shouldn't. Okay, number one, thinking about 
and acting upon inappropriate sinful desire leads to regret and harm for everyone involved. We'll pause for a second and let you guys do that, okay? Thinking about and acting upon inappropriate sinful desire leads to regret and harm for everyone involved. Not just some. I would say that just about everyone in David's immediate family was negatively affected by what he had done. Everyone in this immediate family here between these two wives of David and their children, everyone's going to be, uh, going to be affected. So Amnon had taken time, it tells us, to feed this lust. Um, and it was already consuming him. It says in verse 2, he was so tormented that he made himself ill. Guys, he was obsessed. Think about this. Oh, the amount of time he had to walk away. And maybe that's you this morning. Maybe you don't relate to this at all. Maybe it's something completely different in your life. Maybe you're chasing a dollar. Maybe you're chasing the next rung up the corporate ladder. Listen, don't let it eat you up. Like if you got to walk away from it, walk away from it. Bag groceries at Walmart. I guess Walmart doesn't have groceries because you get the point. Like walk away if you have to. Don't let it get to you and eat you up that way. But Amnon was obsessed He knew it was wrong. He knew it was immoral against the law of God. Every Hebrew knew that, okay? It was very clear in the Old Testament law. As a virgin, Tamar was available, but not to him. It was illegal for him to do that. Leviticus chapter 18 makes that clear. But just like the flesh, nothing has changed in thousands of years. Just like the flesh, what we can't have is where Satan highlights the temptation and takes advantage of us. You know, if I tell you to eat all of this you want, well, there's no temptation. You'll eat it. Cool. But just like the tree in Genesis, you can eat anything you want, but don't eat of this tree. Ooh, that tree right? That's what sin, that's what temptation, that's what the enemy does here. So boundaries were in place by God in his law, in his word, you could say. And perhaps by chance, if left to himself, Amnon may have walked away. Doubt it, but he might have. But here's a major problem. Verse three tells us Amnon had a friend who really would prove to be no friend at all, okay? Jonadab, the, the son of David's brother. So Jonadab was, was Amnon's cousin. Uh, guys, listen, a friend is going to point you to God, okay? So, so obviously, Jonadab is no friend. He's not pointing uh, Amnon to God at all. It says he was a very crafty man. He was shrewd. He was cunning. And he jumped right into it with, with Amnon here. Here's what he says in verse 4. Oh, son of the king. Now, why did he not say, Amnon, dude, what's up? He said, oh, son of the king. I think he's playing on the situation here. You know what? Here's what he's saying. Hey, look, you're, you're, by the way, Amnon was uh, the oldest son of David. What does that make him? He's the crown prince. He's next in line. So what this friend is doing is saying, hey, man, you're son of the king. You're the oldest. You're the crown prince. You're first in line for the throne. Take whatever you want. That's the same thing the enemy tells us. Take whatever you want. So Jonadab proceeds to share this plot with Amnon. Uh, pretend to be sick. You know, if the word gets to your dad, well, the crown prince is sick. That's not a good situation. Okay, we don't need him sick. We need to take care of him. That's a problem. David is certainly going to be concerned about that. So David will play into this plot. And then Jonadab's like, hey, bring your sister into this. Let's work this out. She Play upon her sense of virtue. Take advantage of her in that way. Certainly, she will come to you. Guys, Jonadab is no friend to Amnon. If you got a Jonadab in your life, kick him or her straight up. You heard it here, okay? Kick him or kick her out of your life. I'm serious. Share the gospel as you can. Be a light for Jesus as you can, but don't risk it, man. They'll take you out. Point number two, run away from those who tell you to follow your feelings and desires and to go after whatever you want. Give you a moment to write your blanks. Now, perhaps I was a little harsh in saying that because I'm a little irritated at people like that. (laughs) Okay, so maybe don't kick them completely out of your life. Okay, I backtrack a little bit. But cut ties, they're not your closest friend. They're not a friend, okay? Don't hang out with them. 
You know, be careful the amount of time and space you have with them and, and just be, be, be very careful. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, Paul says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals or co- a good character. If you go to the coffee shop and you don't drink a sip of coffee, right, and you walk out of there, you smell like coffee. Oh, you've had coffee. I haven't had any coffee. But you smell like coffee. When you hang out with people, they rub off on you. We've got to be careful. Seriously, if you've got close friends that are pulling you down, you need to get new friends, okay? But Amnon, he acted on it. Guys, listen, it's very important that I say this here, okay? And I've read some kooks in, online and pastors that think they, you know, I'm not saying I've got this right, but here's what I believe with my heart. Tamar didn't do a single thing wrong. Let's be clear. Let's not try to put something in scripture that's not there. Based on what we read, she was a virtuous woman. She didn't do anything wrong. She didn't flaunt her beauty. In fact, you could call her at this point in scripture a woman of God. Based upon what she did, she obeyed her father. When her dad said, go and do this, oh my goodness, my oldest son, the crown prince is sick and we got to take care of him and he's requesting you tomorrow, you got to go do it. He's doting on a child. You don't do that either, but David, that's another thing he did wrong. He doted on one over the rest at this point. And so she obeyed her father. She respected his request. She went to Amnon, okay? Not at all anticipating what was about to happen. She humbly served her brother. She made bread in his presence at his request. I'd have been like, dude, go to the bakery. You know, I got other things to do. No, she humbled herself. She, she respected her dad. She served her brother. Scripture says she was beautiful. And a lot of people are like, well, that's, you know, you're just too tempting. You're, you're beautiful. That's dumb. All right. Point number three. Tamar's beauty was a fingerprint of her creator. Stop right there. No, point, no blank. Just don't, don't fill your blank in yet. Chill out. <laughs> All right. Guys, she was beautiful because God made her that way. The next time, guys, you look at a woman and thoughts start to go through your head, go, she's either my sister or she's a potential sister in Christ. And she's beautiful because God made her that way. The same thing goes for women looking at guys. God made him that way. Think about that. Let's honor God with the way we think about the one that he created. Not get into our flesh and honor Satan by looking on the one that God created. That's like reverse worship. It's like anti-worship. That's insanity. So Tamar's beauty was a fingerprint of her creator, not a reason for her to be victimized. When tragic events like this take place, it is not the victim's fault. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a few minutes. It's not the victim's fault. I understand. I don't understand. You know, I was telling somebody this week, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I shared that in my uh, first sermon back. You know, we, we are afflicted so God can comfort us, right? And then once God has comforted us, we take that same comfort and we comfort others. So if you have ever been victimized here this morning and God has comforted you, he's calling you now to potentially help others. But I, I was about to say, I get it. I don't get it. Because guys, this has never happened to me, all right? And, and my heart desperately goes out to people who this has happened to. You know, this is not an area, a specific area that God has comforted me in because I've never had this happen to me. But we know there are those here and those hearing my voice, this has either happened to you or you have been involved with this in someone, some, with someone else. But it, it tells us here, you know, she goes and gives them the bread, but he refused to eat and he ordered everybody out. So Tamar was a princess. She wouldn't have come by herself. She would have had an entourage that would have come with her. She lived in a separate section, potentially a separate house altogether, definitely a separate section. So she would have had servants. And of course, Amnon would have had servants. What he says to his servants is get out and get all of Tamar's people out of here. Kick them out. So it's just me and Tamar. Now, does Tamar suspect something at this point? We don't know. I can't help but think that perhaps she did, uh, but we don't read that. But Amnon was not hungry for food. He wanted to be alone with her. That alone is where sin can flourish. Alone is where there's nobody looking. Alone is where there's no accountability. This is all about to go down. He's getting everything he wants here as this plot continues to unfold. Let's keep reading verses 10 through 20. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber, into the bedroom, okay, that I may eat from your hand. And Tamar took the cakes she had made and brought them into the chamber to Amnon, her brother. But when she brought them near him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come lie with me, my sister. 
And she answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this outra- or outrageous thing. As for me, where, where could I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, he violated her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred, so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, Get up, go. But she said to him, No, my brother, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called out the young man who served him and said, Put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for thus were the virgin daughters of the king dressed. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she wore. And she laid her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. And her brother Absalom said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Now hold your peace. My sister, he is your brother. Do not take this to heart. So Tamar lived a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. Stop there. Guys, there's a lot to unpack here. God, I pray for your grace as we do this. Um, Amnon draws Tamar closer. Even more, puts her in an even more vulnerable situation. Into the chamber, verse 10, so I can eat from your hand. Of course, Tamar graciously obliges his request. She goes in there, and that's when Amnon took hold of her. And, and he says, come, lie with me, my sister. And I read that, and I'm like, dude, what are you, you're an animal, man. What are you calling her your sister for? Like, what, is that supposed to make this better? You're going to call her your sister, and you're about to hate her? And you're going to call her your sister. That term is, is, is not going to make anything any better. But look what Tamar does. As incredibly painful and difficult as this is right now for her. She did the right thing. She did the hard thing. But she did the right thing. Point number four. And this is, this is well, point number four. When someone demands something of you that is wrong... Resist. Resist. God has created you with an individuality, with a personality, with an identity, with a self-consciousness that's created in his image. Resist. And that's what she did. She tried to reason with him. It's like reasoning with someone who's drunk, though. You know, he's drunk with lust, and he's not. It tells us several times he didn't pay attention. He didn't listen to her. He didn't heed her. But she didn't just give in. She did all she could do to resist Amnon, to resist the situation. Three or four times we read her, she says, no, no, do not, do not. She says, no, my brother. Guys and ladies and anyone who's in a situation like this, speak up, say no. As a matter of fact, in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, I think it's chapter 21 or 2 or something like that, it says that when a woman is being violated uh, in a situation like this and, and, and rape is being forced, that they're to resist by screaming for help. And, and, and that can be so hard. But she said no. She said in verse 12, do not violate me. What is she saying? You have no right to do this. And I just need to tell you that. You need to hear that. You have no right to do this to me. Whether he listens or it goes in one ear and out the other, she said it. You have no right to do this. No one should force anyone to do anything. So do not violate me. The Hebrew culture A woman's chastity, her purity, was a crown of honor, as it should still be. Um, Jesus comes to make all things new, and we're definitely going to talk about that here in just a little bit, okay? But this crown of honor, Amnon had robbed her of this. 
Guys, the Bible recounts many stories of horrific uh, sexual abuse of women. You know, the Old Testament, again, rape is viewed as murder. Uh, it, it's actually called an outrage. And the, t- the title of today's message, When the Outrageous Happens, the root there, it's an outrage or it's a disgrace. Uh, the, the word for outrage is Nabala in Hebrew. And you'll remember Abigail's husband. Remember the, the crazy guy Nabal, root of his name? Oh, he's a fool. That's where that comes from, right? This is a foolish foolish, outrageous, disgraceful act that's happening here. Tamar says such a thing is not done in Israel. Guys, Israel, God's special chosen people, called to be holy, called to be set apart. Again, the law that God gave them to govern their life strictly prohibited this. It was illegal by the law of God. And and Tamar repeated that warning, don't do this. Another thing she's doing here, and you got to applaud her for this, guys, because in this situation, how could she even have the wherewithal to think to do these things? Right? But she, it's like she's, she's like, stop and consider the consequences here. The consequences for me, the consequences for you. She says, you will bring trouble on me. Verse 13, where would I carry my shame? See, in that culture, she would not be able to outrun this shame and this reproach that would attach itself to her. She would no longer be a virgin. No one would want to marry her. Nobody would want to be with her. No one would care for her. So it's going to be a big problem for her. And not only that, Amnon, you're going to bring trouble upon yourself. Verse 13, you would be as one of the outrageous fools in Israel. Brother, listen to me. You're going to lose any good reputation you may have. You will never be king. You will ruin your life if you do this thing. And in Leviticus chapter 20, it tells us in such situations, they will be cut off from community. And that's exactly what happened here to Tamar, especially. She would be cut off. She would be driven away. Um, Leviticus chapter 20 says, do not do this thing. It is a disgrace. Guys, thousands of years later, it's still a disgrace. It's a disgrace for both. And look at what else she does. I think it's a ploy, but she said to him, she's like, well, speak to the king for he will not withhold me from you. Chances are that that is not true. But this is a last ditch effort on Tamar's part to stop the situation. Once again, the half uh, sibling marriage is not allowed by, the, by God's law. So David would have to have obviously violated the law to allow such a marriage to take place. I think she's trying to get out of this situation God bless her for doing that. But Amnon was blind. He was blind with lust. He was completely blind to the circumstances, just like David on the roof didn't think about what this could lead to, like what's happening right now. Guys, we need to stop and think before we act, before we do. What are the potential consequences? We do not have the ability necessarily to see that. But we're all, I'm going to take for granted that 90 some percent of us in here are followers of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit lives in you. Pray to God, show me what this could lead to. Show me what I otherwise would not be able to see. Help me get a grasp on what this could lead to. Stop me, Lord. Stop me if what I'm thinking and what I'm about to do is wrong. Stop me. He was clueless about these things. He wouldn't listen to her. Being stronger than she was, he violated her. How absolutely, I can't even think of a word, that someone would use their strength to violate someone like this. I almost want to use inappropriate language that anybody would do anything like this. It's heinous. Man, I've heard pastors talk about, you know, anyway. I'm just not even going to say what I was about to say. (laughs) I'm just going to let it go. I'm going to let it go. Here's a question. What about the victim? What about, what about Tamar? I mean, you know, we can, you know, most people who would eat. So again, I didn't really want to teach this chapter. Um, And I really wish it wasn't there. But a lot of people take this chapter and they focus on what we did in the first two points. Look away, cut off. Don't, don't do it. 
Amnon. They preach the sermon as if it's completely to Amnon. But my question is, what about the victim? Because it happens. As much as we preach about not doing what is wrong, wrong happens, and that leaves the victim with what? So we've got to focus on, on the sensitivity to, to the person who's been violated. What did Tamar, what does the victim experience? And, and we see it here in her own words and in the words of Scripture. Let's make a, a fifth point, point number five. The victim of sexual abuse can be left, and I should say maybe is left, feeling completely alone. Alone. You may be here this morning. You may be listening this morning. And you right now are in a situation where emotionally you're wearing the mask when you walk in here. And nobody would ever suspect it. Maybe behind that mask you feel completely alone. Okay? It's just, we pray. We pray that God would be able, and he can, he is able, to penetrate that mask, and to penetrate your heart and soul, and to minister to you right where you are. And maybe you're sitting here and you've done something to someone, and you are carrying a 10-ton bag of guilt on your back. God can take that. You can drop that at the foot of the cross. You can walk away and never pick it up again. Okay? So from these verses, what do we see? Verses 15 through 20, primarily, we, we glean a description, a better description of this aloneness. Um, I'm going to rattle off these words, and then we're going to take a couple of minutes to, to look into them. Hatred, abandonment, mourning, despair, silenced, and desolation. That's exactly what we read that Tamar experienced through this. Hatred. What happened was the exact opposite of what the temptation promised Amnon. The very one that he was convinced was all he wanted and needed, he end up, ended up hating more probably than anyone in the world. Guys, Jesus is the only one who can fulfill us. He thought she was going to fulfill him. That's called sin. Sin is the attempt at satisfying what only Jesus can do, right? And only Jesus can satisfy Amnon. So abandonment. Abandonment. Um, by those who should be your advocate. He was her brother, and if anybody was going to be there for her, it should have been him. Yet he says in verses 15, 16, get up, go. There was a problem here. He had sent everyone out. He obviously didn't send Tamar out. Tamar was the chief witness against him. And he was so guilty. Get out of my sight. I don't ever want to see you again. Because when I look at your face, I'm reminded, among other things, deep down in his heart, what I did was wrong. Now your wherewithal is coming back. Now the guilt's setting in. So he sent her away. Sending me away, she said, is greater than the other thing you did to me. And I read that and I'm like, wait, it kind of sounds like she would rather stay than go. If sending me away is even greater. Guys, she's stuck in a difficult situation. This highlights how huge her shame would be in, in loneliness. Again, not having anyone to support and care for her in that culture. A big deal. Tamar would have to wrestle with the demons of feeling like she had done something wrong. When she hadn't. She would perceive that she had lost her value as a woman. And none of that is true. But that's what the ugliness of this causes. Put this woman out and bolt the door after her, verse 17. Now, very interesting, this, this verse here, without it, spending too much time. In the original Hebrew text, and I don't know uh, enough to be able to clarify if this was an intentional move of the Holy Spirit or it just happens to be written that way, but the Holy Spirit penned scripture, so I would think he knows what he's talking about. You get my drift. But in the original language, the word woman is not in the text. So in a, in a kind of a roundabout way, this verse would literally say, put this out. Didn't refer to her name. Didn't refer to her identity. At this point, she's an object, and she's not welcomed in my presence. That's the heinousness of what Amnon is doing. So Tamar goes into mourning. She puts ashes on her head. She tears her robe. She considered her life as a loss. Guys, the robe, it tells us, was reflective of her status as princess, as daughter of the king. And it was torn. Her place in life had been shattered. No doubt she's mourning. Shame in the life of the one who's been victimized can, can, can plague the individual for so long. It feels like it'll be forever. It feels like that you'll never move past it. And that's where Tamar was. In verse 19, she, 
has her hand on her head. She's crying aloud. She's in despair. Verse 20, what in the world is Absalom saying here? We don't have time to dissect it too much. But she's in despair and she feels silenced. And he says, hold your peace, my sister. Now, what, what are you saying, brother Absalom? Hold my peace? Perhaps he's saying, sis, it's okay, because I'm going to take Amnon out for what he did to you. And he will. Okay? Not that that was right. Another Bible study. And we'll talk about it a little later. But taking matters into your own hands is not the right thing. Maybe that's what he's saying. But here's, I think, the way it came across to Tamar and the way it can come across to many people today. Don't say anything. Keep it close. Hold it in your heart. Don't let it out. Don't let this get out. Okay? That is wrong. That is wrong. And of course, she lives as a desolate woman, verse 20. Even lost her quarters, her housing. She's now having to live with her brother, Absalom. I mean, what of hers was left? Again, guys, God's word doesn't shy away from the effects that all of this had on Tamar. Let's not gloss through this so quickly that we miss these words, that we miss Tamar's heart and soul in this situation. And it could be, we don't know, but it could be that she was at a place here where she struggled to believe that God even cared. And I would venture to say that many people today feel the same way. God, do you even care? You know, do you? Well, he does. And that may be where you're at right now. Too discouraged, too angry, uh, not not hearing from the Lord. You're in a, a desert place, a dry place. So what is God's word to the people in that place? What is this message of hope? I've heard these sermons before. I've heard this advice before. It's, it's, a, it's a brick wall. Where is God's hope here? Point number six. Point number six. Jesus offers hope and restores a sense of value to those who have had theirs stolen. He offers hope and he restores a sense of value to those who have had theirs stolen. Now, at this point in the message, I could, I could elaborate on... Um, finer counseling points. I could reach back and research some, okay, what do you say when? And I'm not going to do that. I'm not a counselor in that degree. Um, I think God has primarily called me to teach his word, and I think his word speaks to at least prime our hearts and souls to walk in the right direction this morning. Um, think about some people from Scripture. Um, again, whether it's, it's, you know, I think I thought this week about Mary Magdalene. Different situation. But she was under pitiful oppression as she was uh, uh, possessed by seven demons. We read about her at least a dozen times in the Gospels. So her name is out there. Suffice it to say, we don't know the details. It's not given. But life was really, really bad for her under the possession of seven demons. But it tells us in Scripture that Jesus cast those out and gave her freedom. Right? And, and she became a really close follower. She was the one that was there for his crucifixion, his burial, and one of the first to see him when he rose from the grave. So she became a close follower. She had a close connection with Jesus, right? Again, the first to see him risen, she had privilege. So here's a woman possessed by seven demons. She goes on to have freedom, connection, and privilege. That's a snapshot of what Jesus can do in anybody's life, regardless of where you've come from. Let me read some verses and let God's word speak for itself. Romans chapter 8, a number of verses here, and I think they'll be on the screen for you. Paul says, What shall then we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? And this situation we're talking about this morning fits in that list. Is that going to separate me from the love of God? Verse 37, no. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Not just conquerors, but more than conquerors, if that's even measurable. That's what Jesus can do. We are more than conquerors. For I am sure, Paul says, that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Amen. There's a snapshot of what Jesus can do in your life, regardless of what you've done to someone, regardless of what has been done for you. I can't fix it. Your friends and brothers and sisters can't fix it. Jesus can fix it. He can give you new life. He can meet you there. I am not saying we as brothers and sisters should not be involved. I'm saying we aren't the answer. We can usher you to the answer. We can bathe you in the answer. We can offer you hope in the answer. But he's the answer. He's the answer. Again, if God is for you, no one can be against you. Nothing can separate you from his love. Let's go to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 61. Guys, here's where I wish this was a three-parter because we would take each of these and break them down. There's so much here. Isaiah chapter 61. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the, and, and, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint heart, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Verse 7, instead of your shame, there shall be a double portion. Psalm thirty seventy three: the Lord is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. And not just a portion, but double portion for those who have been in these situations. Instead of dishonor, they shall rejoice in their lot. Therefore, in their land, they shall possess a double portion. They shall have everlasting joy. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I understand in context, this is Old Testament. It's God's people. But in better, greater, huger context, it's the living word of God. And there's so much application in this for every single person, every one of us today. This is what he does. He binds up the brokenhearted. He gives liberty for those who have been bound. Comfort to those who mourn. Beauty for ashes. Praise instead of a faint heart. A double portion. He gives joy. And, and, and he hates the robber. Amnon was a robber. He stole something that didn't belong to him. Tell me God's approving of that. Absolutely not. He hates the robber. He hates the activity here. And he brings what is good. Guys, God heals. And, and, and there are the victims that are plagued with self-blame, with self-hatred, thinking they've done something wrong, feeling worthless. Bring those feelings to God. And, and, and you might say, well, I've done that over and over and over again. Don't stop doing that. Don't stop being around people that are going to encourage you to continue to do that. Real quick, if we could throw the train diagram up. You guys have seen this. It's really old, er than me. Um, uh, Campus Crusade, I think, did this a long time ago. And just a real quick thing. They don't even have steam engines anymore, so I have to explain myself for the young people. But back in the day, steam engines moved um, because coal in, in the middle car was dumped into the burner. And the, and the burner would burn the coal and heat the water, and the steam made from the water would compress, and it would create a pressure, and that's what would move the train forward. So the analogy is this. You have the, the, you have the uh, engine, and you have the coal car. And the coal is dumped into the engine and that's what gives it the energy to move forward and then you got a bunch of other trains but forget about those for a second but the tail end you got this pretty red caboose does anybody know what a caboose is does it, did anybody i learned that a few years ago when we took one of my kids i didn't even know what it i thought it was a pretty red thing that dumbo slept in i didn't know what a caboose was okay well that's actually what it is it's the sleeping quarters so we found out if they told us the truth it's the sleeping quarters of the staff of, of the train back in the day, among other things. Um, but here's the thing. It's a pretty red caboose. We call that feelings. So we call the engine fact. We call the coal car faith. We call the caboose feelings. Listen, if you dump your coal into the way you feel, where's your train going to go? Nowhere. I know it's hard, but guys, we're, we're tempted in life to put our trust in how we feel to put our energy into how we feel. And if we do that, we're going to never get ahead. But if we put our faith in the fact, in the word of God, bathe your heart and your mind in God's word, and you put your faith in the fact, you will move forward and the proper feelings will follow. Every single one of us in this room and listening to my voice are tempted to trust the way we feel. It leads to a dead end. We can't do that. Psalm 147, he heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. Only God can do that. 
Lamentations chapter 3 says some great things. I can't read it all. We don't have time. But, but I rejoice in, 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 in God. Um, his, his, his love never ceases. Great is his faithfulness. New every morning. What does that mean? That means if I go to bed tonight and I feel like a loser and I feel like life has been stripped from me and everything is over and I pray to God, oh God, you know, weeping may last for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Well, it feels like it's been a million nights and I haven't had the joy yet. Lord, wake me up in the morning. May your joy be manifest in my life. I want to pursue you even if I'm down. God, just, I pray that you would just pour that out into my life. Seek him early in the morning. New mercies in the morning. Guys, let's, um, let's keep going. Verse 21. When King David heard about all these things, he was very angry. But Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he had violated his sister Tamar. After two full years, Absalom had sheep shearers at Bel Hazor, which is near Ephraim, and Absalom invited all the king's sons. And Absalom came to the king and said, Behold, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. Let him come with me. Verse 25, But the king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him, but he would not go, but gave him his blessing. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. Hmm. And the king said to him, why should, why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him until he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Then Absalom commanded his servants, Mark when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, drunk, under the influence. And when I say to you, strike Amnon and kill him, do not fear, have I not commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. So the servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose and each mounted his mule and fled. While they were on the way, news came to David. Absalom has struck down all the king's sons and not one of them is left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the earth. And all the servants who were standing by tore their garments. But Jonadab, the son of Shemaiah, David's brother, said, Let not my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon alone is dead. For by the command of Absalom, this has been determined from the day he violated his sister Tamar. Now therefore, let not my lord the king so take it to heart as to suppose that all the sons are dead, for Amnon alone is dead. But Absalom fled. And the young man who kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming from the road behind him by the side of the mountain. And Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons have come, as your servant has said, so it has come about. And as soon as he had finished speaking, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and they wept. And the king also and all his servants wept very bitterly. But Absalom fled and went to Talmai, the son of Amahud, king of Jeshur. And David mourned for his son day after day. So Absalom fled and went to Jeshur and was there for three years. And the spirit of the king longed to go out to Absalom because he was comforted about Amnon since he was dead. Yo, David, why is your, where's your heart for tomorrow? Worried about your boys. I, I basically have to do half the chapter in like three minutes here. And so Absalom was quick to figure out what had happened despite Ammon's call to be alone. His guilt was obvious. There's a lesson there. You can't hide. It'll come out. And it did. It's sad. Tamar didn't go to David. Why? Culturally, maybe. Uh, or perhaps she realized he's not going to do anything. Dads don't have that kind of reputation where you're not going to do anything if something were to happen to a child. David was angry. And he should have been angry because what had been done was wrong. He should, this should have been the righteous anger that we read about in Scripture. The righteous anger. Anger at sin. Anger at evil. That prompts us, that motivates us to do something right about something wrong that has been done. But David did nothing, really. There was apathy. There was silence. And that was typical with his kids. Similar in 1 Samuel chapter 2, Eli and his sons. It's a very similar situation where he put his sons above God. 
And in a way, that's what David is doing here. So instead of confronting the abuser, he protects him. And that at the victim's expense. And maybe some of that is David's own guilt coming out because of what he had done. He couldn't handle it. Well then, David, you need to make it right. I mean, he's forgiven you. We read that already in chapter 11. But you're, you're abdicating your duty here. Absalom didn't say anything, just as his father hadn't said anything to his sons. And To say nothing, the anger is going to seethe, it's going to grow, it's going to become a monster for two full years. That's two years of plotting. This issue was never confronted, and failure to confront can make matters worse. Our last point, number seven, if sin isn't dealt with properly, the fallout will spread further and be more furious. And so they have a, it's a sheep shearing season, similar to harvest festivals today. It's a time to party. Let's all gather and live it up. And, and you know, Amnon invites all the boys and, and, or excuse me, Absalom invites all the king's sons. And, and David's like, ah, it's a burden. And then he's like, well, make sure Amnon comes. And verse 26, David's like, why should he go? Yeah, David, good question. Like, dude, why do you want Amnon there? Like, what? Scratch your head. Yeah, something's fishy here. But he... What does he do, you know? And, and then Absalom tells his servants, be courageous and be valiant. Kind of reminds me of what you read in Joshua. Be strong and courageous. And you're hijacking that, telling your, your servants to be courageous and valiant. What, to take matters into your own hands? No, we don't do that. That's not, that's not what God calls us to do. As bad as what happened, he doesn't call us to take people out. Again, as bad as what Amnon had done to Tamar, this was not the answer. Revenge is not the answer. But Absalom's servants killed Amnon, and, and the rest of David's sons fled. And again, I just keep thinking, if David had taken care to do what he should have done, this wouldn't have happened. But the victimizer is dead. What does that do for Tamar? Nothing. Really. That doesn't change anything that happened. That doesn't meet her where she is. That's just perhaps in some ways because of the, David's wanting to come back to Amnon and his heart bled for Amnon uh, after all these years. His, his hurt for Amnon rather had lessened. So his, uh, excuse me, these names. His hurt for Amnon had lessened. So his heart longed for Absalom. How about long to make things right? That, that's what should have been. Tough chapter. Yeah. We sing a song, and it's been a long time. There's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. And maybe this morning you're sitting here and you have the chain of all these things we've talked about loneliness, despair, abandonment, guilt, shame. And neglect or the weight that you've done something wrong when you haven't. Something was done wrong to you. And you just want to pray to God to break that chain. I would pray to our holy God that he would break that chain and set you free. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning with a load of guilt and shame because you have done something to someone. You have been the Amnon in this situation. Same is true for you. There is power in the name of Jesus to break that chain. If you fall on your face before the Lord and you confess that and you repent of that, he has forgiven you. New life is available to you. What does Paul say in 1 Corinthians or 2, chapter 6? You know, he lists off all these sins and he says, some of, some of, uh, the, as, these were some of you, but you have been washed. Doesn't matter what's been done or what you've done. If you come to Jesus and he makes you a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5 says everything old is gone and everything is made new. And, and that's what he offers every single person here uh, this morning. A few things to remind you of uh, here. We have this uh, card. Hopefully you received this card when you came in this morning. If you, um, if you need help 
If you're, if you're battling thoughts of yesterday or you're involved in something that's been even closer than years ago, maybe it's recent, you're struggling with having uh, experienced sexual trauma in your life, uh, reach out here. Again, hope at thrivekg.org. Somebody's going to respond to you. Don't, this is not, oh, this is going to go to a junk mail. No, somebody is going to reach out to you, meet with you, talk to you, whatever needs to happen. Because guys here, there's hope, there's healing in Jesus Christ. You do not need to continue to carry that burden and that weight of what has been done to you or you have done to someone. Reach out. We want to we want to be available. There will be people that will reach out to you, individuals. Uh, we've given a number of resources to you. I believe there's a QR code. Is there a QR code in your note sheet this morning? Um, uh, it's there on the note sheet. If, if you need help, scan that QR code. Uh, tons of great resources that are available uh, there when you when you do that. Guys, there are going to be individuals stationed around the congregation or the, 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 the gym or whatever we call this thing here, the living room, uh, uh, sanctuary, uh, that's right, that's where I was looking for, uh, with, with lanyards on. How can I pray for you, okay? Uh, uh, listen, there's no shame in any of this. If you just need prayer, or you know someone who's struggling and you want to pray for them, look for someone this morning wearing a lanyard. Uh, they're going to be there for you. They're going to be there uh, to, to, pray, uh, to pray with you. Um, I, I just, I, I can't say it enough. There's hope and there's healing in Jesus, but it's only in him. And guys, I pray uh, wherever you find yourself this morning, um, I guess I'm, I'm not asking you this, I'm praying this, so let me pray. Father, I just pray, God, this morning for those who um, are carrying this burden of guilt and shame. Lord, it, it can take so long as we work through these things, but Father, I pray that they would surrender that at the foot of the cross this very morning. Lord, the cross is in this place today. The picture, the symbol, the reminder of what you have done for us. That you died for all sin, not just some sins. That you died to make us a new creation. Not just in the sense of Obviously, primarily, you made it to make us a new creation in salvation when the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. But Lord, also a new creation when we're able to, to get rid of the baggage, throw that at your feet. And Lord, you can wash our minds and you can wash our souls and you can wash us of those things. Pray that you would do that today. God, hope is only available in you. And Lord, the greatest hope that we have is salvation. And Lord, if there's one here this morning that hasn't embraced the new life in Jesus Christ, that haven't admitted that they're a sinner, that, they, that you died on the cross to save them, I pray that that would be part of the transaction today. It would be the primary part of that transaction, Lord. That they can be a new creation this very morning. That your Holy Spirit will come and live inside of them, Lord, and to make them that new creation and to set them free from so much in their life, Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus. And God, we pray that power would be manifest in every single life, meet every single individual right where he or she is this morning. God, we thank you for what you've done. We give glory, all glory and honor to you. And we do pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.